Hey everybody, how's it going? Marcos Viegas for Fight Up TV, powered by Stage Front VIP, being joined with Bob Santos, boxing trainer, but more importantly, the trainer of uh, Hector Garcia. Bob, uh, thank you for uh, stopping by with us. Uh, I just wanted to get a, a check-in, check-up on, on a few things. Uh, first off, um, after the fight that you guys had with Hector uh, last weekend, um, you informed me that Hector had to go get a CAT scan, go checked up. Uh, how is Hector? How is he doing? And is his eye okay? Uh, he's doing obviously a lot better now. Thank God. Um, you know, during the fight, uh, I had seen a tremendous amount of uh, redness in the eye. Not not your normal kind of blood vessel thing. It was really, really deep, you know, cherry red all the way through the eye. So obviously I had, you know, a, a lot of concern for that. And I, I thought the uh, prudent thing to be was for him, obviously, to go get a a CAT scan and, and thank you, thank, thank God, you know, that, that that's came back as negative. And so uh, we're very thankful for that. So it was just a, a burst vessel or, or what exactly had happened to the eye, if anything? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Cause you know, uh, I, you know, obviously things like that can be very complicated because you have so many nerve endings and things of that nature. But uh as far as we know, at this point, everything came back uh, negative. And, and, but it was really strange to see how, you know, uh, how cherry red it was through the white of his eye um, uh, on that right side. So, um, you know, I had never seen that before. You know, like, like I said, you know, you see people get red eyes, they get something in the eye or, you know what I mean? They wake up with a uh, one side of the eyes kind of red, but to, to be cherry red all the way through, I had never seen that before. So obviously I had a lot of concern for that. And, and you know, thank God they did the cat sand. They said everything's negative. So like I said, again, we're very thankful for that. How is Hector doing it? And how is he uh, processing everything that happened uh, during the fight? You know, um, he's doing good. Obviously, he knows, uh, it, it, you know, we we're in the fight. Uh, I've said it uh, before, and I'll say it again. Um, I, I thought the eighth round, the start of the eighth round was our, our best round. I, I went and watched the tape without the sound, without, without the commentary, and it was definitely a dead heat fight. You know, you can make a little argument one way or the other, but it was, it was definitely a very competitive fight. And again, I thought we were doing very, very well in that eighth round. And whatever happened with the, the fans and how everything stopped and it just kind of uh, it really killed the momentum for us, you know. But uh, when the action resumed again, obviously, you know, Tank capitalized on it, did what he had to do and, and, and he got the win. But up until that point, it was a very competitive fight. And it's one of those things I always look back on and say, I wonder what would have happened had, you know, that that. Uh, uh, thing in the audience break out and had the referee not stop the fight and so we'll never know I mean again you know maybe that would happen in the 10th round or the 11th round because obviously Gervonta is a tremendous puncher and, and we knew going in he could change the fight on a dime with one punch but if you look at the fight and anybody's being honest with that fight that's a very competitive fight very competitive fight so um but you you feel like man that's one that got away from us and and, and I think he knows that uh, but uh you, 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 you know, you can't look back, can't look in the uh, rear view mirror. You got to look in the windshield and, and try to move on to, to different things and hopefully defend his title at 130 or whatever opportunities at 135. And, you know, we're going to have to put a good run together to, to get in that type of position again. Speaking of, of uh, the fight, like I know you were focused on the fight in the ring, but did you take notice as to like what, was happening and now that more infos uh come out you know it was like meek mill and, and like the russells like getting into it ringside over cheering for and against gervonta in the fight well i i think you know obviously i had time to process during the time of the fight you know i, I went up to the referee and i says hey you, you you shouldn't be stopping the fight right now for something that's going outside the ring if something happened inside the ring then I understand there's a threat to the fighters. Um, then definitely I think the fight should have been stopped. Um, I think the referee dropped the ball on that. Again, takes nothing away from Gervonta, right? Because both of them are in the same situation. But I think you do a disservice to the fans on TV. I think you do the disservice to the fans that came to pay to watch these two guys fight 
to be worrying about an altercation in the crowd. If it doesn't affect what's going on in the ring, like fan men or somebody came up into the ring, you know, I, I think universally you got to let the fight play out. I mean, I, you know, I've been in professional boxing for 31 years. I've never seen that. I mean, I've seen melees break out and you don't stop a fight. So I, I definitely think the referee dropped the ball on that. You know, he's paid to be a referee, not to be a spectator for what's going on in, in the audience. So, um, and again, to me, it definitely changed the momentum of the fight. Doesn't take anything away from Tank. He did what he had to do. He won the fight uh, fair and square, but it changed the momentum of the fight. And uh, I, we just can't have that. You know, uh, I just think that just does a total disservice to the sport. You got people paying money on pay-per-view. You got people paying their hard-earned money to be at these fights. And we're going to start focusing on people that haven't been in camp for 12 weeks, haven't paid the price for what's going on. They're not what is supposed to be being focused on. So I, I think moving forward, uh, that just shouldn't happen. And I think that the commissions need to get together with these referees and say, hey, look, you don't stop a fight unless you see something coming up on into the ring. You know, so uh, we're disappointed in that, to say the least. When it was happening, like, did you like get to see what was happening ringside or were you? Yeah, just I knew kinda, everything yeah. that was happening. So I was very, I was, you know, I was on the referee and, and everybody. I says, hey, look, man, we have a fight here. This fight should not be, be, be being stopped. You know, so for me, like I said, I've been in this sport my whole life. I've never seen that before. And I've been, all over, I've been all over the world. I've been in Africa working world title fights. I've been in Europe working world title fights. I've been in South America working world title fights. I've never seen them stop a fight inside the ring for an altercation outside the ring, like I said, unless they're coming into the ring. And in and, 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 and the future, that can't happen because, you know, guys have worked their entire lives to put themselves in this position, and you just disrupt the fight for that. Um. You know, so again, and that changes the momentum. And in this sport, you know, momentum is everything. And if, and if you look at the eighth round, I really thought Hector was was picking it up. I thought we won the seventh round clearly. I thought we were picking up the eighth round. Uh, he had put together a good combination, hit Tank with a good uppercut, and we're off to a good start. And then all of a sudden, like I said, you change the entire momentum of the fight. Now all of a sudden you sit there and you're waiting for a while. And anytime you could give a, a guy like Tank, you know, virtually a, a timeout in the middle of a round and he's that type of a puncher and he has time to recuperate his energy or oh, it could be good night Irene with one punch what did the ref tell you when you told him like hey when you told him all that when that was happening um he basically blew me off you know he he, he blew me off uh, wasn't paying attention to anything that i said and uh but but again i i he never should have stopped. You, you're there to referee a fight. You're not there to be a spectator for what's going on with the fans. That's just my personal opinion, and and that's the way I think it needs to be. Because if we're going to start doing that with sporting events, I mean, we're going to stop everything. Football games. We're going to stop baseball games. We're going to allow fans to dictate, uh, you know, guys who have no common sense or I don't know what the hell is going on in there and make them the center of attraction. We, we just can't have that in sports in general, period. Based on what you saw from Gervonta, how do you see Ryan now matching up with uh, Gervonta? Well, obviously, Ryan's got good length, right? He's got good speed. Um, the one thing that I, that I do take away in this is, is uh, I think Ryan Garcia made a tremendous uh, uh, move to go to Joe Goosen, right? I worked under Joe Goosen. Joe Goosen's a very, very savvy veteran. Uh, he has a lot of tricks to the trade that I'm sure he's going to help Ryan Garcia with. And I think a lot of people are underestimating that. They're always just looking at the physical attributes of, of Ryan Garcia. But don't underestimate uh, Joe Goose, who's very, very, very savvy. A lot of tricks of the trade. I learned a lot from, from Joe Goose. And so I think he's going to add uh, 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 an element that people are underestimating, right? Not just uh, Ryan's speed, so on and so forth. Um, the thing with Ryan is he's got to be very cautious again, like what happened with us. If you look in that fight, you can make the argument we're ahead or it's a dead heat, right? And I think the most adamant uh, Gervonta fans would say Gervonta was up 4-3. So it's a close fight. Obviously, Ryan's got probably a little bit more speed than Hector. He's longer than Hector. But 
can he take Gervonta's punch for 12 rounds? And the thing with Gervonta is that people don't understand is uh, he has a high ring IQ, very high ring IQ. So you got to factor all those things in. And then the other thing is too, and I always try to tell my fighters this too, until you've been in the mega event where there was Hector, this and that, you got to figure maybe take about 20% off of the fighter of what he normally is because you got to handle the pressure of the event. You're going into the event, you're a little tight. That's even with Hector. I thought he was finally catching a rhythm in about that eighth round where now we're just fighting. It's not. And then unfortunately, like I said, the momentum changed with all that that we've already discussed, but it takes a few rounds when you're in that kind of a mega event. So people are not looking at the fact that Gervonta has that edge. Cause he's been, a, you could say, well, it wasn't the level of competition. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the event itself. It's the stars are coming out. It's the, you know, and you realize, hey, if I win this fight, these things are processing through your head. Oh, my God, I'm in the eighth round. I win this fight. I'm this close now. Financially, I'm going to change everything for my entire family, right? So these things you have to process and handling the event. And I always tell everybody, you know, um, I, I remember uh, with Robert Guerrero, with Floyd Mayweather, I'll never forget, we're in the green room together and interesting tidbit you know it'd be probably good out there for the fans to hear this but uh so you know floyd tells robert guerrero you ready for this you ready for this and robert's like oh man i'm ready man i'm toe-to-toe however you want it and you know i seen floyd uh maybe two three months after the fight and you know and i looked at him and what he was talking about is he wasn't talking about are you ready for the fight See, in Robert's mind, he's like, are you ready? Oh, man, I'm ready to go toe-to-toe however you want it. But what Floyd was really saying to Robert, are you ready to have, handle the fact that now all your family members want the tickets? Are you ready to handle the fact that now everybody wants your time? You got to do the interviews. You got to handle this. How are you going to manage your time management to prepare for the fight? All those types of things that go into it. Now you have family members saying, oh, man, financially you're getting it. There's so many things that start swirling around in the tornado. And so Ryan really hasn't been in that situation yet to a degree, but not at that level, not at the level that it's going to come within a mega fight like that. Mm. Well, then, uh, given your professional experience, who wins, who's going to win based on how both have looked in the last fights? Um. it's going to be a tremendous fight. You can't count Ryan out because of his physical attributes. And I think Joe Goosen uh, is a great tactician. Um, Don't underestimate, uh, you know, how, you know, everybody's just thinking Ryan could just be, you know, boxing this and that. There's nobody better. I think at Joe Goosen than, than getting you ready for, for real combat. He's a master. So, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a very close fight, but you know, uh, Germante, like I said, he's got a high ring IQ. He could be down on the cards, but man, he's got the great equalizer. I'm not saying that Ryan might not be capable of hurting him with a quick left hook, but if, you know, gun to my head, I, I probably lean with, with Gervonta because the thing about it is he's got the great equalizer. He's got a high ring IQ. And he's been in those events. He has the experience in those events. So if you had to favor one or the other, I would favor uh, Gervonta Davis, not taking anything away from Ryan Garcia. I'm not saying he's not capable of winning the fight because he's got electric fast hands and he can hit you with something and drop it on a turn of a hat too. But all things being equal, you probably like the guy, like I said, that's been in these events. He's had to handle these types of things, high ring IQ, and he's a southball. You got to factor that in. Um, and he's got the great equalizer. All right. Yeah, that's, that's you know, a lot of people are conflicted uh, with that fight. Some will sure, say Javon, that's what makes it a great yeah, fight. Yeah, right? some will say Javante by knockout. Others say, like, hey, no, it's, it's a 50 50 fight. It's going to be very, very close. So, you know, that's certainly a, a fight that uh, we hope. Uh, our, uh, I don't want to say actually gets made because they've agreed in principle, but gets made, gets over the line and that we see him in the ring. Did he mention anything about Tank's power? I know a, a lot's said about Tank's power. People have said that, you know, he's, he's a special uh, puncher given his size and his ability to be able to put people out. Uh, what did he tell you about his power? 
Um, no doubt about it. You know that obviously he ha he has good tremendous power. Um, he felt that you know uh, the punches that he could. You know we all know this. The punch you don't see coming is a punch that can really hurt you. So everything that he was in control of up until that eighth round, he ate any left hand tank through right hooks. He took all those punches tremendously well. What happened is he got in that shoulder roll stance and he kind of dipped over. He gave a little bit of the back of his head. And he kind of got hit a little bit on the uh, uh, on the back and the side of the head, and for whatever reason, you know, that really disoriented him. And and then you know, uh, the rest is history from there. Is he in good spirits? Like, is he um, like what? Have you guys had a conversation about the fight since the fight happened? Yeah, you know, we we watched it. Uh, okay. We watched it together since 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 the the fight happened. I mean, obviously, he's happy with his performance up until you know, the, the, the melee with the fans and this and that, because realistically tank really came on strong after that break during the round. If you, if anybody goes and looks at that, that round in the eighth round, seventh round, we won that round. Clearly the beginning of the eighth round, Hector started out really phenomenal. I was really pleased. I thought we were catching a rhythm and then boom, the thing happened with the fans. It stops. You give a guy like Tank a minute, 30 seconds, you know, in between a round, I mean, during a round, let alone in between a round, and with that kind of energy level, now he could pick it up and start coming on, and then Tank kind of took over from that point on, even before he hit him with a big shot. Tank was actually hit him with a couple of decent shots, you know what I mean, and started catching him a little bit, and then that's when he caught him, you know, when he shoulder rolled on the inside. And we were working on camp and that because, you know, I had told Hector, I says, the, if there's one area that he's going to be able to, where you're going to be susceptible is if you do that on the inside, right? But it's hard to break something to 400 fights. You, you know what I mean? You're not going to just break that in one or two camps. So that that's one thing, especially against southpaw. Right-hander, that's fine. But with the southpaw is going, you know, it could be very dangerous. And and unfortunately, that's what happened. So when when you guys watched the end of the fight, what, what was he telling you there um, when you guys looked back at it? Well, when he got hit, you know, he felt like he got hit, you know, in the back of the side of the head. He really couldn't, you know, see what was going on. Obviously, the light, the, the, the lights turned out. And um, so he really couldn't see what was going on. And he just was disoriented. If you notice, the referee had to take – he was going actually into tank corner. didn't really know where he was at. So the referee actually had to take him and turn him to go towards our corner. And he was kind of disoriented. <clears throat> and when he first made – when he first walked back to the corner, he didn't even come to me. He actually came to our cut man. So he went to the cut man as if it was me. So he just didn't really know where, where he was at with that punch and uh, – you know, and then the rest is his. And then at that point, when you when I was talking to him and he's a little bit disoriented, he says he can't see, you know, in the beginning, obviously, you're thinking, OK, we can overcome this. Uh, let's see where we're at. Let's try to uh, uh, re revise him and and uh, see where he's at. And, and, and if we could go out there, get through the next round and then let's see where we're at at that point. But then it just became apparently clear to me um, when I looked in the eye. He had told me I couldn't see that, you know what, uh, it's my job uh, to stop the fight at this point and, 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 and live to fight another day. And, and, and again, I think he'll be back. I think he'll defend his title at 30, and I think he can make a good run. And, and I think he could posi position himself to get another great opportunity because uh, up until that point, with one of the most devastating punchers in boxing, as far as the boxing goes and everything of that nature, we were on equal footing. You're making it sound, not making it sound, but based on you looking at him and knowing him, being in camp with him and knowing Hector as a fighter, like he he just, he didn't know where it was. He was out of it. There's no point in having him continue. Um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to hear some of the reaction from the fight. Uh, some of it, uh, depending on which perspective you're at, uh, could maybe you know bother you as a trainer. But Teddy Atlas did uh, his podcast and he said sure. straight out, Hector quit. He quit. What do you have to say to people uh, that listen to that or listen to other people that say, like, no, Hector quit on his stool? Well, you know, I, I respect Teddy a tremendous amount. I think he's one of the best trainers there is out there. And, and, his, and his knowledge of boxing is second to none. I'm never going to question 
what he sees or he analyzes because, you know, he, he's seen it all. He's been there. He's done that. Um, but for me, two things, when I kind of, you know, he wasn't responding the way I wanted him to respond. And when I seen the eye was, you know, totally bloodshot red all the way through back. I've seen, like I said, we've seen more blood vessels or nasty cuts. I've been in this game a pretty long time too. And my cousin fought in the 1956 Olympics. So my family has been in boxing a, a hell of a long time too. So, um, I'm not going to question Teddy's, like I said, knowledge of the game, but I've, I've been there a long time too. Um, you know, I'm not in Hector's body. Um, that being said too, uh, for me, you know, I just had David Morale that was in the ring with uh, uh, the guy from Kakistan and where he almost got killed and, you know, and he was in a coma for two weeks. So I was just in the corner for, for that thing. So I had to make a decision at that point. And, and the decision was, is, you know, is to, is to shut it down. Um, now, Hector's the only one that will truly ever know. Uh, I, I can't say I'm not in his body that will truly ever know if he could have continued on, if what he's telling me is exactly true. Um, but at that point where I said, where he told me he couldn't see, where he told me, you know, the eye was totally bloodshot red all the way through. And again, with what happened with David Morale, just, you know, I was just in his corner a couple of weeks before where, you know, that fight probably could have been stopped in the eighth round. But that guy chose to continue on and now he'll never fight again. You know, and he was in a coma and almost got killed. But I understand where Teddy's coming from because I'm old school, too. Remember, I I was I worked with Chico Corrales. Or, you know, I was in, 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 in one of his camps. So there, there was nobody that ha had more heart and balls than guys like that. Robert Guerrero that I worked with since he was 14 years old. So I understand, you know, uh, everybody's different and I don't know the exact situation situation with, with him, you know, so, but I'm not going to disrespect Teddy Atlas at all. Uh, he sees what he sees. He analyzes what he analyzes. And, uh, but for me as the head trainer, I was in a position where this guy's telling me something the eyes completely bloodshot red all the way through. And like I said, it wasn't just like a blood vessel to me. So at that point, I'm going to err on the side of caution and I'm just, I'm going to call it, I'm, I'm going to call it, call it a day. Yeah, no, there's, there's, and this is not like my opinion uh, chiming in on this. Like there's part of me that is like, gets really infuriated when we shame this, when they decide not to go, because I look at it from the outside and granted, I'm not a fighter. Like, and I'll get to that point where their mentality is, but like, I look at it and it's like, is it really worth a fight to go blind over the rest of your life? And then what does that leave them? Is it really worth getting brain damage? You know? And then like, then what happens because of, you know, you not wanting to stop when you're out of the fight or, or hurt, like, is it, is it worth that? And I've even asked, you know, fighters and, and they've told me like, no, it's not worth it, but you got to understand this is what we've signed up for. We're of that mentality that like, Hey, it's kill or be killed. I'm going to go out my shield. Like, this is how it is. So I, I get that part. And I remember like, I asked Chris Algieri one time, you know, about his eye against the Provodnikov fight. And I asked him if, if you knew you were going to go blind, but that's what it costs to be a world champion. Would you have been okay with that? And he's like 110% I would have. And I was kind of like, what, what's wrong with you? And he's like, that's the thing. You guys won't ever understand us. Like we're not, normal we don't think like you people that's why we do what we do so it's it's a thing that you know when when i heard that it's like part of me is like like dude like you don't want him to be blind like you know like we're not going to be paying his bills at the end of the day like we're not that his kids are going to have to like grow up with him like not being able to see like why are you shaming this guy like for doing that so it, it, it's been a very conflicting thing whenever this comes up for me because I, you know, I see it from that side, but then again, you know, I'm not one in there in the ring and, and I know these guys, they're just different in the way they approach this than, than us as observers are. Well, you know, uh, like I said, uh, in terms of greatness, right. You got to overcome. So I see where Teddy's coming from a hundred percent, the great ones, you find a way you bite down, you find a way, but, we also got to take things in context. Every situation is different. If the guy truly can't see, 
he truly can't see and it and and it's not coming back to him how are you going to overcome that if you're going out there and you really can't see you don't know where the hell you're at i mean you're not going to overcome that if it now if if if, if you're seeing stars or you went out and then you're kind of coming to a little bit and you're groggy. Okay. Then yeah, obviously that's what you sign up for. You need to buy time, do the things that you need to do if you want to be great. But again, I I'm not in Hector's body. The only one that's in his body is him. And he's the only one that's truly ever going to know where he was at. Right. He's the only one that's truly going to ever, ever know. And he's going to have to live with himself with that you know uh did he let a golden opportunity slip away i don't know he's gonna have to live with himself with that for the rest of it for the rest of his life but if it is true into what he is saying and he really was gonzo then and i have to listen and take into what account what he's telling me because if i send him out there and it was true what he's saying then he's not going to be able to buy time he's completely gone and he's completely blacked out or can't really see anything. Not like where you're seeing two guys or you're concussed and you can, you know, kind of get by. If it's truly to the point where you really can't see Eddie, then I'm sending him out basically to the slaughter. And, and I can't do that. Right. I can't do that in good conscience. Like I said, you know, I've been, I, I've been in this game my whole life. I seen what my, cousin went through that fight in the 1956 Olympics was number one in the world in the era where there was only one champion where you had six out gloves. And, and I seen what he went through towards the end of his life, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, I don't want to sound uh, vulgar, but you know, shitting in a diaper, right. At an age where this is my mom's first cousin at an age where he, he shouldn't have been, been like that. So obviously it was from, you know, the fights, and yes, that's what you sign up for. We all understand that. But I couldn't in good conscience send him out there. And, and remember, I'm just coming off the fight where I seen David Benavides, uh, what he did to uh, the kid from Pakistan, who will uh, never uh, fight Morel, again. you mean. Morel. I mean, yeah, Morel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, know, you, you, you know? mentioned something. It's like the great ones. He, he mentioned it too, but you, you brought it up. The great ones find a way to overcome. But it's like, well, what's the cost? Like, look at, look at the, our great ones. Like the uh, majority of them slur, you know, that it's damage to them. So it's like, I don't know it's, it's for me, I guess it's like a struggle like, yeah, it's, when it's you what, say that, you know, you know but like it, at what it, cost? It's what, it's what they sign up for. Um, but again, would you say Roberto Duran's a great fighter? Oh, legend, legend, okay, not great. You know, special. But, but we weren't in his body that night. He fought Sugar Ray Leonard and he said no mas. And unfortunately, um, you know, that's something he's going to have to live with and he ha and he's going to have to overcome. But the, the great thing for Hector is, is guess what? He's going to have another opportunity. He'll have another bite at the apple. He'll defend his title at 130 pounds. And, you know, and he can show what kind of metal and what kind of heart he has. Um, unfortunately, uh, th that's the one thing that I kind of bothers me with boxing is we judge fighters too harshly on one fight, right? A guy loses one fight. No, he's a bum. He wasn't that good. He wasn't as good as we thought he was. And we got to stop doing that, you know, as a sport, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be doing that. You know what I mean? Hey, guy lost one fight. Doesn't mean it's the end of his career. And, and in this sport, it's, it's, you know, in any other sport you do that, even in the UFC guy loses five, six, seven times, puts on a good fight. Hey, you know, they still rally behind him. And we got to do that as fight fans and say, Hey, you know, cause a guy loses one fight to a pound for pound, one of the best fighters in the world or a big puncher. Um, we shouldn't be so down on that guy. And, you know, you could judge him on that one fight and, and, and say, you know, I think he quit in that fight or this and that. But, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, one fight or one incident at one time should judge a guy's in total career. You know, so that's just me. Um, but I see where Teddy's coming from. You know, like, again, I was raised old school, too. You know what I'm saying? You go out on your shield and, and you can't tell me I've been I had Robert Girl since he was 14 years old. You're right. I had him when he fought Keith Thurman and he went into the fight with Keith Thurman. He was bedridden. People don't know that he was bedridden the whole week of the, of the fight with the flu, got dropped in the fight, got up, continued to go. But, you know, and Guerrero never came to me and said, hey, I can't see or this and that, because, you know, maybe I would have took I would have took the, the keys out of his hands, too. You know, or or Arizlandalar that I worked with, who got dropped two times very viciously with Angulo. 
right? Oh, he was able yeah, to I remember open. that. I was there for that. That was yeah. a tremendous freaking fight. Wow. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So uh, I've been around all these guys, and and and, and so every circumstance is different. I, I don't like I said, we're not in his body. We don't know, but I see where Teddy's coming from. If you if you truly want to be great, there's 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 things that you're gonna have to overcome. And uh, hopefully this is a one-off situation. What happened with Hector, and he'll have another opportunity to prove what kind of what kind of fighter he is. What do you feel could have been done differently uh, in order to secure the win uh, against Gervonta that night? Um, I thought Hector fought. You know, he was fighting a, a, a great fight. I mean, he was controlling distance. Um, we were hitting him with good counters. I, I, I you know, I, I we were right there in the pocket. He was taking all of uh, Gervonta's punches very well and the giving and taking. Um, I thought he was using the jab very, very well. Um, you know, the only thing, uh, uh, unfortunately, you got to be very careful when you shoulder roll with a south ball when you're in close, right? And we had worked on that in camp. So one of the benefits of having 400 amateur fights is you have all that experience. One of the negatives of having all those amateur fights is that's a habit that's going to be hard to break. You can't shoulder roll on the inside with a southpaw. If you're a southpaw, that you're, 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 you're leaving yourself open, and it's very dangerous to do so. So we had worked on that in camp, and unfortunately, he was controlling the distance, and it was a little bit of a habit that's hard to break. And then he got on the inside with him in the eighth round, and he was in that shoulder roll stance, and Tank was over to, able to come over the top and hit him with a tremendous punch. And that's what really started uh, the free for all. From there, you know, he was disoriented. Then he went back into the ropes, got hit with two straight left hands. And obviously the rest is history. Had we been able to avoid that, I really feel confident that we are off to the races in a dead heat. And, uh, you know, you never know what the judges are going to do or what they're seeing. But I think in the uh, court of public opinion, everybody knows damn well that was a dead heat. And had that fight stayed that way for the next three rounds, you know, you can make an argument one way or the other, and definitely there would have had to be a rematch in play. So now we're going to have to go back to the drawing board, fix some of those, those types of things, and he's going to have to go on a good run if he wants to get in those types of fights with a, you know, a, 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 a Gervonta Davis again and so on and so forth down the road. But Hector proved he's on that level. You know, he got caught with one big shot, but he proved he's on that level. So if you think about, uh, say, a Devin Haney or a Shakur, are they going to be able to hit Hector with that kind of a shot? I don't think so. So uh, that being said, he he can win he, he he can win a fight with a Devin Haney. He can win a fight with Shakur. He proved he's on that level. He just got caught with one big shot. Outside of that, everything was pretty equal. When is he going to be able to to be back? Uh, did he get a medical uh, suspension in himself for how long? And, and when would you like him to get back in there again? Um, I you know I don't know what the ringside physician did at the time, um, but. I personally wanted him outside of that to get a CAT scan just for my own peace of mind, right, outside of what the commission was doing. Um, so I, I think when you're in there with a puncher like that, you took that type of a punch, I, I, I think uh, to err on the side of caution, I'd like him to sit out of the ring for, for a good long period of time, recoup his body, no rush, um, you know, and, and then we can sit down, focus on what we want to do. Is it totally going to be a target at 130 or 35 and then make a good run? And, and then, you know, he's going to have to go out there, whether it's fair or not fair. You know, some people, like I said, are going to say, oh, as far as I'm concerned, he quit in that fight. Um, you know, so he's going to he he's 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 going to have to make a good run in his legacy, kind of like. You know, even Roberto Duran, he went on to beat Iran the Blade Barkley, but you can almost never live that no moss down, whether it's fair or it's not not fair. So he's going to have to, like I said, put together a good run, and I know he's capable of doing that. And um, and I think people are going to be surprised at some of the guys that he's going to go on to beat down the line. Uh, when you say a few months, three months, six months? No, I, I, I want him to at least be out of the ring a minimum of six months. At you minimum know. six months. Just um, the, the way okay. I, the way I, I you know, the, the CAT scan, everything came back negative. Um, but, you know, just because you, you see sometimes uh, with medical reports, uh, you know, it's negative. There's no cancer only to find out, guess what? There was cancer. Right. So that's why they're called practitioners. 
You know, people say, oh, the doctor said this and this said this. You're practicing, you're practicing medicine. Doesn't mean you're the be all and end all and you're the good Lord Jesus Christ. You're practicing medicine. So for me, the way I seen the eye, I would rather err on the side of caution. You know, give it the, the six months because, you know, Hector's only had 16, now 17 pro fights. Doesn't have a lot of wear and tear on the body. You know, he's still current world champion at 130 pounds. And like you said, and, and I said, uh, you know, I understand what these guys sign up for. But for me, and I used to tell Robert Guerrero this all the time, you know, when your career is over, you may not like a lot of things I did. You're not always going to be happy with me. There, I even told Robert, there's probably going to be times that you hate me. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Because to me, at the end of your career, when I could say that you're financially set, when I can have a conversation with you, um, that means more to me than, hey, let's just send them out there and do, do this now. You have to have some kind of humanity, too. That Yes, they sign up for that. And that, believe me, I'm balls to the walls. Mm. Because when Hector first came to that corner, the first thing I did is I tried to revise him and say, hey, baby, we can do this. Let's, you, you know, tie him up, buy time, do the things that you got to do. But at a certain point, you're not in the guy's body. And at a certain point, you, you have to know when to say, hey, you know what? If he's not in his right mind and he's going out there, you know, I'm, I'm just sending a, you know, a, a hen to the slaughterhouse. I'm not going to do that. So, you know, and, and I have to live with myself. I have to look in the mirror. And I would want, you know, uh, fathers or mothers to know when they send a fighter to me or even promoters, you know what I mean, or managers that if you care about this guy, that I'm going to make the best possible decision I can uh, to put him in, in, in a decision that, you know, that uh, is going to be beneficial to him. And we're going to make that decision together. In, in a case of a Chico Corrales, you understand that, hey, he's going to go out there, or whatever the case may be. I'm all for it, but I'm going to do everything I can to buy him time, help him, help him get through the fight. But that's something a trainer and a fighter have to look at together in that corner, and you have to make split life or death decisions. Bob, thank you for that. Uh, thank you uh, for the time. It, it was great uh, chatting with you. Uh, really appreciate it, man. Uh, that was Bob Santos, uh, Marcos Villegas, Fight Up TV.